feel inadequate in addressing an issue that is so vast, and the reason it's so vast is because everyone's individual experiences are different. This is, of course, the, my second lesson. This will be the last one. I'm going to try to fit a lot in this one. On a spiritually mature look at what it means to be single. And one of the reasons this is so important is because, well, half of the population, more than, uh, more than half of those who are religious are married, but just under half are single. And anyone that's married, well, they were single. And half of people that are married will be single eventually. And if you were to just mentally right now just think about all of the people, let's just say those who are adults, not just not kids, but just adults who are not married, never been married or divorced, and that are single. If you were to just kind of do that inventory in your mind of the Christians that you know or just those who are part of this congregation, then you were to think about those who maybe are widows. Uh, then you begin to think about those who are divorced. Uh, you think about those, uh, those different categories, and all of them fall into sort of different states of uh, where they find themselves in life. And so their struggles are all going to be a little bit different, but there are principles in Scripture that address these in particular. Even Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 that we looked at last week that different people have different gifts, that Paul had the gift of, you might say he was saying he had the gift of just being single, and it wasn't really that big of a deal for him. And there are some people who that's like. I had uh, some, some people, a lot of people actually contact me after last week's lesson uh, that expressed different perspectives. Some said, you know what, I don't really struggle with it. I couldn't really relate to some of the things that you were saying, but what I would encourage all of us to do is to understand as we're going to find really what is what I've been trying to get to in 1 Corinthians 7, the nugget, I'll go ahead and tell you, the nugget really is in verses 29 through 31. We'll get there though. Um, it's applicable to any and all situations in life. It's applicable to single people. It's applicable to married people. It's applicable to people who are sick. It's applicable to people who are married. It's applicable to people who are doing well in their job. It's, it's applicable to people who are broke. What Paul says within this passage is something I believe will help all of us. And so as I dive in, I understand and feel inadequate because of the inability to really address all of the various perspectives of people. But to understand that it is something that's important because we need each other. Because as I stated last week, and we'll continue through this lesson, the number one goal of Christians is faithfulness. The number one goal of single Christians is faithfulness, to maintain our faithfulness. Just as sort of a recap of last week, I looked at 1 Corinthians 12, looking at Paul's writings, and actually I'm going to look at something that Jesus said at the end. Because look, Paul can say stuff all day long, but when Jesus actually says something that reinforces and adds a different, uh, another depth to it, then we see the unity of the inspired word. And uh, it's not that Paul is validated more, it's just that we see that there are certain things that are not just addressed by Paul, but that were actually addressed by Jesus in his ministry. First place we looked at was 1 Corinthians 12, which is really about the body of Christ, that we're all individually members of it, and that whatever position you find yourself in the body, that you're valuable. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you bring to the table, so to speak. And that we, that we have an understanding that whatever it is that we bring to the table, well, God expects us as we are continually sanctified, continually transformed, that what we bring to the table actually will be transformed. And that we will, as we find ourselves as maybe one part of the body, we will, as our usefulness, you might say, increases. As our building ourselves or growing into the image of Christ matures, we will find ourselves maybe shifting in which part of the body of Christ we, we are. And that's a healthy thing when it comes to growth. If, you, if you're not finding that you're changing where you are over a period of years, decades, so to speak, then that may be a sign that you're not growing. But we're all valuable because, well, think of it in terms of, say, the economy, right? Um, you know, somebody that's, I, I started working at a fast food restaurant when I was 14 years old. I would walk to work. 
and I would, I, I, I didn't even, I didn't even make the, the uh, hamburgers. I, I made fries. That's what I, 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 I've never run a cash register in my life. I wouldn't know how to do it to save my life. I made French fries. They were really good French fries. I've grown out of that. But there are some people who, they need a little bit of money, and that's what they can do. And they're expected to grow out of that, and that's normal. And so where you find yourself in the body of Christ, it may be that you were, not to sort of be tongue-in-cheek, but maybe you're the fry expert right now because you're young and you're new. You're expected to grow out of that into something else, but don't worry. There will come along many Christians who that will be their specialty, and that's okay. And they're not expected to have that as their specialty for a while. And so we're all valuable as we grow and evolve and are transformed in and through the body of Christ. Then what we looked at was 1 Corinthians 7, which we're going to spend a lot of time today. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul begins by, if you remember, answering questions that were sent to him from the Corinthians. If you remember chapters 1 through 6, He's addressing things that they didn't know that he knew, which is a fascinating concept. He's like, hey, I heard about some things going on. Chapters 1 through 6 are about that, and they're the, the really rough stuff, right? He gets to chapter 7, and he says, okay, now I'm going to talk about the things that you've asked me about, the itemized list. And that's, you might say, kind of normal in the sense that don't we have questions that we might, if we could, write a letter to an apostle and say, hey, help me out with these things. Well, we have that happen in 1 Corinthians 7, which is important because... It means that we can relate to the first century. They had difficulties with how to handle them. handle uh, relationships, where your status is in life, and that sort of thing. So Paul says, says, look, it's important for people to abstain from sexual immorality. If it were up to me, you, you, you all would be just like I am single. But, but in order to be faithful, because that's the goal, in order to be faithful... If, you, if you're struggling with being faithful, go ahead and get married. One of the things we talked about was that that's not a license to just marry whoever so that you uh, don't get caught up in sexual morality. Because the number one goal is faithfulness. And, and so when Paul says go ahead and marry, he would not say marry someone who would then jeopardize your faithfulness. That's what we talked about last week. Single people need empathy from married people. That's what... That's what is sometimes lacking. It's something that you have to be purposeful, intentional about. Uh, but married people, married people need that as well. Married people need empathy from single people. We, we need to be able to step out of ourselves and to see, see through someone else. It's the idea that you're, you're placing yourself within their perspective and being able to see what's going on with them. Oh, you know what? They have, they have kids? Well, I've never thought of that before. Well, well think about that and, and the difficulties of that. And the, the difficulty even of coming to an assembly like this with, with children. Single people kind of are oblivious to things like that from time to time. And so we encourage each other's faithfulness simply by understanding each other's perspectives. And it's not just single married people. It's, it's empathy in all areas of life that we don't experience with someone. That we understand their perspective even if we don't share that perspective When you think about the, the conflict that we're going to see in 1 Corinthians 7, and what I mean by conflict is, is it seems as if Paul's going to go back and forth a little bit. Seeking a godly marriage is great. God instituted marriage. And he would not institute something that he would not bless and sanctify. It's an important thing. But we're to seek godly marriages. But as we're going to see in this passage, seeking to be single is also great. If, same requirement, what's the goal of a Christian? To be faithful. And so if we're seeking marriage, we need to seek a marriage that's faithful to God. And I, I'm hesitant to pull the trigger on doing a, a, a lesson on marriage. I, I've talked about the idea of doing one because it dovetails with these principles that marriage is... is primarily about the two becoming one only so that they can glorify God or be more holy themselves. 
Well, what we're going to find Paul talking about is the idea of seeking singleness, but only if that singleness is a matter of faithfulness or is a godly singleness. There are many people who get married and they leave Christ. There are many people who, whether out of selfishness or or just by chance, they stay single and because because they have not purposed themselves to be faithful, they get caught up in other types of sin and they leave Christ. And so whether we're, wherever we find ourselves, whatever we're seeking, wherever you, and Paul's going to talk about this, wherever you find yourself presently, it should be our goal as a matter of seeking godliness wherever we find ourselves. But first I want to address, before I get to 1 Corinthians 7, I want to really begin by addressing a particular group that Scripture makes clear should be addressed and taken care of. A group that shouldn't be overlooked. I encourage you, is it up here? There we go, all right. I encourage you to turn to 1 Timothy 5. We're going to look at sort of a, a lengthy passage, but we'll go through it quickly. 1 first, first Timothy 5, and if you remember this is, and this is something that's important, is that 1 Corinthians was written during Paul's second missionary journey, probably from Ephesus, riding back to Corinth. Many years have passed, and he's already had his two years of imprisonment in Rome. And he gets out, and now he's writing 1 Timothy and Titus. So that's, that's where he is in his ministry. And he's writing probably, I believe we could say, writing to Ephesus, which is interesting. He wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus. He's writing 1 Timothy several years later to Ephesus. The reason that's important is because when we, when we get to 1 Corinthians 7, we're going to see that he's talking about a present distress or something that's going on that is particular to the time and the place. And so he's going to recommend particular things that may seem to conf- conflict with what he's going to say in 1 Timothy 5. So it's important for us to understand the time difference and the place difference, different situations, different people, but that the principles that are going to be expressed, they perfectly go together. So there shouldn't be a problem. So let's begin here and work through this quickly. 1 Timothy 5, starting verse 3. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. Uh, Other translations actually say repay their parents. Children owe their parents for raising them. And it's the duty of a family to take take care of usually, sometimes it's both parents, but usually it's one. And that is, that is part of being a faithful Christian. And so whenever you uh, see someone who is taken care of either both or one of their parents, encourage them, recognize that, give honor to whom honor is due, uh, because they are repaying to their parents and, and being godly and faithful to God in, in honoring uh, the duty that and the responsibility that their parents embraced by then taking care of them in the older age. So he says, make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Verse 5, she who is truly a widow left all alone. So a true widow is not just someone who's, whose husband has died. And of course, when you look at passages like this, as you'll see in 1 Corinthians 7, it, and even when we get to Matthew 19, there's, there's a certain element of, you might say, it's written in a way that is generic, even though it's talking about one particular sex. It's talking about widows, but it could very well be that the wife has died and it's a widower. It could be that he's talking about a woman who wants to marry a guy rather than a guy who wants to marry a woman. And so you, the principle goes to either, to either sex. I just wanted to clarify that. So you have a truly widow. He says, left alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household... He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So now we have just the principle of, of the, say, the head of the household, taking care of his household. That's a godly principle. And to not do that is to deny your responsibility that God has given you. And so we have this, 
we have this dichotomy, you might say, true widows and not true widows. The idea of a widow who still has family and a widow who doesn't have anybody. Okay, what are we supposed to do? Verse, verse 9. Let a widow be enrolled. If she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions, uh, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Now, this isn't, there is not within this the assumption that someone who is, who is younger and whose husband dies, that the idea of them getting married again is somehow evil because he's going to clarify that. He's talking about how sometimes, sometimes if someone who is younger, uh, who then begins to be taken care of by the church, he's making this clarification that he says, you know what? If someone is of the age that they're probably not going to remarry, then he says the church is going to step in. Uh, but if someone is younger, he says, then let's, let's hold off on that because what's likely is that that may be taken advantage of because she's going to seek to be with someone else. And there's going to be a conflict of taking care of her. And so there's, there's Paul looking at it's sort of like the housekeeping of the church in the sense of looking out for the, the church being abused and the church actually doing something that someone needs. All right, where were we? He says in verse 13, Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So, he says, I would have younger widows marry. So he says, it's not bad, but he's encouraging them to enter into a situation, if they don't have a family especially, Enter into a situation where they can be taken care of. They can enter into, and that's, see, that's the beauty of the roles and responsibilities that God has given, right? We have the, you, when you, sometimes you think about the authority structure or even the organizational structure, even of the church, responsibility of the elders to the members, the responsibility of Christ to the church, the responsibility of the, the, uh, the man of the household, the father, to take care of the wife and the kids, the responsibility of the parents to take care of the kids. And you have this, these roles that come with responsibilities. And so what he's saying is, is that those who are younger widows, he says, well, what's appropriate is for them to enter into a situation that God has sanctioned to take care of them. This is not some rebellion against feminist ideology or something like that. God has instituted this responsibility of a husband to take care of his wife. And so someone who finds themselves who are young and, and a widow, he says... It's good for them to enter into this, this particular institution that God has designed to, to take care of people. In particular, in this instance, to take care of a widow. I'll, I'll start in verse 14 again. I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are, are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. And so now you have this, this widows with, with families, then widows without families. And the widows who are without families, you find this strange term found a couple times. Let them be enrolled or not be enrolled. What are we talking about? Do we have, do we have something like that here? Uh, most congregations don't have anything like this. It's kind of a bizarre thing to us, but we find it in Scripture, this idea of being enrolled. The, he says that those who are true widows, those who are over 60, th don't have anyone to take care of them. They are to be enrolled. In other words, they are to devote themselves to the church, and the church, the church is to take responsibility for them. I typically find this to be something that the church doesn't, kind of out of sight, out of mind. And he says it right here. And of course, the conclusion about younger widows is that they should be remarried. But you look at a couple of passages, James 1.27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows, their affliction, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. But in, So that's a principle you find in James, but you actually find this idea of enrollment. 
you find it very, very early in the church. You find it likely before any of the New Testament is even written. And you find it enacted by the apostles in Jerusalem in the infant months and years of the church. Look what we find in, 1 excuse me, in Acts 6, 1. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists or the Greeks arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And that's, that's what we're talking about. The Greek widows, the, the Hellenistic widows, that they were being neglected in what Paul refers to in 1 Timothy 5 as the enrollment or the idea that there are a certain group of the church who are single that the church is responsible to take care of. And that this particular group, and this, see this is where you find what, what is the purpose, what is really the, the life mission of someone who finds themselves as a widow who has no intention of getting remarried and especially doesn't have any family to take care of them, they are to be taken care of by the church and to devote themselves to the work of the church. In fact, it becomes their ministry. It's like they become ministers within the church. And it is right and appropriate for them to be taken care of by the church. And so, you know, whichever category a widow falls into, they need to be recognized for the need that they have. You know, in the study of this, one of the first things that came to mind was something that, something that Karen said that I, I didn't know. I heard it secondhand. Karen, uh, after Marvin passed away, that very soon after that, I think it maybe was a Sunday morning, that Alex, who was not here, so I'm going to embarrass him. Alex, uh, had to, uh, Alex had to work this morning, but Alex followed her out to her car and essentially said something like, I'm here for you, whatever you need. Now, Karen has, she has quite a vast family, actually, and, um, which is a, a good thing. But what we found is this, if you've observed it at all, and this is not the only situation, but Alex has been able to be a blessing to her in her singleness, and she's been able to be a blessing to him in his singleness. And it's within those types of relationships that we find what Paul's talking about here being manifested. They're taking care of those because we recognize that every person has a particular different kind of need. And if I'm bold enough to talk about marriage, then we can talk about the types of needs that married people have that can be recognized by, by other married people, by single people, and by the church. Now I want to shift to where I've been talking about, 1 Corinthians 7. Paul's answering these questions. And Paul gives, as we looked so far, and I'm skipping down quite a ways. There's so much to, to cover He's giving specific recommendations to single people. And within this passage, what we'll find is, is we'll find the, the key, the key to contentment as a single person, and really the key to contentment in any situation you find yourself in, in any state of life you find yourself in. So we'll start in verse 25. Let's work our way through this. 1 Corinthians 7, starting verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed, and we'll stop right there and, and say, most translations say virgin. Another, another way this could be translated is maid or maiden. And it's, you might say, very similar to the difference between, in Spanish, senora and senorita. It's, it's someone who is simply not married yet, but may get married sometime soon. And so while it says virgin or it says betrothed, what we can think of it is as someone who is single, but it, they're, they're, they're at the age where marriage is likely imminent all right so we're going to find that a few times so don't be thrown off by this word usage or word translation it says now concerning the betrothed i have no command from the lord but i get my judgment as one who by the lord's mercy is trustworthy and i want to state here also paul says earlier in this chapter he says i say not the lord say and then he continues to talk that doesn't mean that he's writing uninspired in fact, the last verse, verse 40, he's going to say that he believes he has the Spirit of God, that he's writing by inspiration. What he's talking about is that in Jesus' ministry, Jesus addressed particular things specifically. But there are certain things that Jesus didn't address specifically and that Paul is going to address now. So when he says, the Lord didn't say anything about this, but I'm going to say something about it, that's, that's what he's talking about. It's not, he's not saying, now here's my opinion, take it or leave it. That's not what it means. These are inspired principles that we have to figure out how they apply to us. 
Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I get my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Okay, the present distress, we don't know what that is. There's some people that think that Paul thought that Jesus was going to return right then. You kind of find that in 1 Thessalonians 4. Some people would say, oh, he thinks that Jesus is going to, to return, but then he changes his mind in his later writings. As time goes on and as Jesus hasn't come back yet, he somehow changes his mind. But I don't buy this at all because that sort of a way of thinking about, about Scripture undermines its inspiration, as if the Holy Spirit didn't have any clue and was going to allow Paul to write something that would then need to be corrected. And so I want us to be careful about that. As I talked about before, writing to Corinth from Ephesus, second missionary journey, this is a particular situation. And we've done studies of, of Corinth before and the very evil place that it was. So it could be they had some sort of, some sort of uh, increased temptation or increased persecution or something like that. And so... We don't need to definitely label what this is, but understand that there is a particular context within which he's giving these recommendations. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Verse 27, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. If you do marry, you have not sinned. If a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. That's strange, isn't it? You married? You got a wife? You need to live like you don't have a wife. Your wife probably wouldn't like that. Is that what Paul's talking about? All right, where was I? He says, those who have wives live as though they had none. Verse 30, when those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Within this section, we find the key, really, to contentment in any situation you find. And let's continue through this, and then I'm going to elaborate on this in a moment. Verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. The married man is anxious about the worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about the worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. And that's key. What's the goal of the Christian? To be faithful, right? And the way that he's described this is the, is the key to contentment. He says, to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Are you married? Well, live like you're not. How do you do that? Because you have an undivided devotion to the Lord. We'll describe this more in a minute. Verse 36. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, that's just a man who wants to marry a, a girl and they can't exercise self-control. He says if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It's no sin. Whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So we're talking about someone who maybe they've thought about getting married, but... In their good judgment, in their estimation, to get married is not what is best spiritually at the moment. And if they can maintain, maintain purity, then he says, it's best right now in this situation to just remain as you are. Verse 38, so then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Because he talks about this, this extra responsibility that you're taking on. Verse 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. Isn't that interesting? 
And it, it may be a matter of the, the understanding that marriage is hard. Marriage is difficult. It could be that within the context that we're not totally aware of the, the present distress, that the extra responsibility and burden of marriage may be too much for most people at this point in time and that those who can remain single and it may be just be a temporary point in time he's talking about those who can remain single well that that may they may have an easier an easier life at that moment they may be happier but this principle could be just in general that he says you know what those who can stay faithful and single will be happier most single people i know would disagree Because most single people I know have never been married. That's when it comes into the understanding of the empathy that's needed between single people and married people. The understanding of the difficulty that is there. Now, Paul, through inspiration, knew the difficulty of the responsibility that you take on yourself when you become married. And so there is this necessity for a single person to be able to know what they can't know by experience but they can know because they've been told or can observe that perhaps they would be better off single. And there are some who embrace that. And there are some who really struggle with that. So when you go back to verses 29 through 31, here, I'll just put it back on the, up on the screen here. Go back to verses 29 through 31. Paul, Paul says that married people will have a struggle with a divided focus between, you might say, marriage work and kingdom work, which shouldn't really be a conflict, but it will always, it will always stand as something that could be in competition with the work of the church. It seems, in my estimation, it seems today that as Paul's talking about being devoted or see being divided in your focus between the work of the church and your marriage I think there are a lot of people who are single today who have a divided focus between the work of the church and their singleness and they are they are allowing the fact that they are single to get in the way in some way in their mind they have a divided focus what Paul is saying about marriage here I see a lot of pe people who are single doing the same thing and it's because the principle is applicable to any state in life. As, a, as he doesn't just talk about being married, who does he also talk about? He talks about poverty, prosperity, mourning, rejoicing. He's talking about anywhere you find yourself in life. There's a principle here that will help you to not struggle with a divided focus so that you can be content wherever you find yourself. And so what Paul is saying, in my humble exegesis of this passage, is that we must not be consumed with our physical state as if it's permanent. Whatever physical state you find yourself in, it's just permanent. And so he says we must not be consumed with this. It doesn't mean that we ignore that we're married. It's just that we understand. We have the proper perspective. I, I am married, but it's not forever. I'm single, but it's not forever. I have money, but that's not forever. I'm poor, but that's not forever. Things are going good right now, but that's not forever. As far as being tied to physical things, we have a joy, of course, that transcends it all in Christ. Are you miser miserable right now? It's not forever. What he's talking about is is that a significant focus and anticipation of the return of Christ, and in particular, being consumed with our union with Christ, our oneness with Christ, that we experience right now as Christians, but that we will fully experience at His return, that our focus and anticipation of this will keep us from being fixated and consumed by our singleness, and will keep us from being fixated and consumed by our marriage, it will keep us from being consumed by poverty or prosperity, good times and bad times. Our focus on Christ will keep us from being consumed by anything 
that is temporary. And so being consumed with Christ, or you might say our focus on our marriage with Christ, our union with Christ, our spiritual oneness with Christ, when we're consumed with that, then that in turn sanctifies our singleness. It sanctifies our married life. It sanctifies our poverty. It sanctifies our prosperity. Whereas if we weren't consumed with our union with Christ, then our singleness, our marriedness, our prosperity, our poverty, our good times, our bad times, those would stand in opposition to God. Those those would be potential barriers in the way of our faithfulness. Those would be temptations to, to take our contentment away from us. He says when you're consumed with the right thing, then it will in turn transform and sanctify any place you find yourself in your life. Because marriage to Christ is the only permanent thing at all. So what's the the nugget we find in 1 Corinthians 7? That we need to understand what is permanent and be consumed with that. And when we do that, that's, that's what's able to get us through any place we find ourselves in life. And we must let what is eternal give meaning to the things that are temporary. You know, in, in Matthew 22 and in Mark 12, you know, we find the Sadducees coming to Jesus and questioning him about the afterlife, really. He says, you know, who's going to be your, your spouse? And what does he say? He says, oh, oh, in the resurrection, you're neither married nor given in marriage, but you're like the angels. You might even say there's, there's no gender in the spiritual realm. That's a physical attribute. That's a temporary thing even. Your gender is a temporary thing. And so we can't be consumed with it. God calls us to faithfulness. You know, 2 Corinthians 4, starting verse 16, Paul says, so we don't lose, not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporary. The things that are unseen are eternal. And so if you're struggling with, you're struggling with being content in your marriage or in your singleness, or being content in being laid off, or even being content and being prosperous. You need more, you need more. And Paul says, understand that all of those things are temporary. Let what is eternal give those meaning and purpose. Now Jesus also talks about single people. But it's, it's in a passage that we look at one part of it, but... A lot of times we don't see what he says after it. Because what he says lends itself to some controversy because of its seriousness. And so let's look at what Jesus actually says about this in Matthew 19. And Matthew 19, 9 gives really a very basic um, the basic doctrine, uh, the basic ins and outs of his parameters for marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Matthew 19, 9, he says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual morality and marries another commits adultery. In other words, two people are married. They divorce for any reason other than one of them committed adultery against them. The third party was brought in. He says, if they're divorced one of, and one of them marries another, then they're committing adultery. In other words, there's only one reason why someone could rightly get divorced and then remarry someone else. And he says, it's if their spouse has committed adultery against them. The one who committed adultery against them, if they go off and, and marry someone, they don't have a right to do that. But the one who has, who has been, you might say, the innocent party, if they choose to, as it's described that, uh, that Joseph was going to put away Mary, if they decide to put them away because they have committed adultery, then he says, then they can remarry. And you find this very simple command here. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual morality, and marries another, commits adultery, because they are bound to one another. They are one flesh. God sees them as bound. Even if they decide to to divorce, 
God still views them as bound to one another. But the reaction to this is interesting because that is, that is how most, most people who claim to be Christians do not even recognize this passage. The words of Christ himself. They do not abide by this passage. The world definitely does it. They, they don't at all. They say, oh, we can marry and divorce however, however many times we want to. It doesn't really matter. But Jesus has said something very, very different than that. Verse 10, the disciple said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to him, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. That doesn't mean it doesn't apply to everyone. He's just saying most people aren't going to, they're not going to abide by it. He says, for there are eunuchs. Okay, here we have, find the eunuch. Maybe your mind goes to Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. A eunuch just means someone who's not married. Uh, someone who is uh, abstaining from the sexual aspect of their life. And he says, he says, there are eunuchs who have been so from birth that it's not their choice. Um, even if they wanted... Even if they wanted to be able to have kids, they wouldn't be able to do that. He says there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And you might say that the Ethiopian eunuch was, uh, that was his choice, but uh, also there are some who were enslaved and that was done to them. And that was, those wasn't their choice. But he says this, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves. In other words, there are, there are those who have chosen singleness. It's not compelled upon them. They have chosen it. Why? For the sake of the kingdom of heaven. There are those who have chosen or they have resigned themselves to be single for the simple reason that they want to be faithful to God and serve Him. And they understand that getting married would mean unfaithfulness. And it may be the case that they would be, they would be disobeying the command of Jesus in verse 9. And so they choose to be single. So he says, there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. And so Jesus is talking about really the seriousness of marriage. And he says that there is one particular category of person who chooses to abstain, abstain from marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven in order, you might say, to maximize their work for the church. That their primary goal, what's the primary goal? To be faithful to God, right? If that's your primary goal, then if you understand that, you know what, I, I, I have I've divorced, there hasn't been any adultery. Uh, as Paul says, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 7? He says, you need to do one of two things. You've got to stay single. You can read this, the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 7. Stay single or be reconciled to that person. Those are the only two options that you have if there's no adultery. And so Jesus is recognizing that there's a person who chooses to abstain from marriage for the sake of faithfulness. Now, there are a few different categories of, of singleness. We, we, the widow or the widower, we've looked at that, of what Scripture says about that. The person who is, has never been married but is hopeful, you might say, I fall into that category, you might say. The person who has no plans, no interest in marry, I know a few of those as well. The person who is divorced has the right to remarry as, Je as per Jesus' command. They, they, someone committed adultery against them. They divorced and have the right to remarry. But then there's another category. It's the person who's divorced and they simply don't have the right to remarry. They, they, have, they have the responsibility to stay single or to be reconciled to their spouse. And I know quite a few people in this, in this situation. And we need to understand the command of Christ and their, their need to be faithful and what that looks like and to encourage them in that faithfulness. We should revere those, give honor to those, lift up those who revere, excuse me, who embrace this duty of singleness. We need to lift those people up in honor as they have resigned themselves to make their sole focus their marriage to Christ. Understanding what? In 1 Corinthians 7, it's just temporary. It's just temporary. We can, in whatever state we find ourselves in, even if we can't marry, we can be content. We can have a joy that transcends it all. Understanding that what is temporary should not define us, but what is eternal defines us. Now, many Christians 
or who those who claim to be Christians, in this situation, they just ignore these plain words of Jesus. They choose to do whatever they want to do, getting married even when they don't have the right to. This is one of the most difficult things within the church to address. It can divide churches. It can pit groups against each other. Jesus' words are pretty plain. And so when single people have resigned themselves to be single, let's revere them for their determination to do what's right. Sometimes faithfulness requires being single. And those who are not eligible to remarry, they stay single to be faithful. And that's, that's a great example. It's a beautiful example of understanding that my temporary state is not all that there is. Because it's temporary. And it doesn't have the power to determine what only eternal things should determine. But too often we let things that are temporary define our lives. And the outcome of that is that we're not faithful to our duty and to our mission. You know, Jesus, he was single because he had a mission. Paul was single. He had a mission that probably a wife and kids would not have done well with. And if you're single, if you're single, be on a mission to embrace the opportunities and the freedoms that single life gives you. Understanding that's just temporary. It's just temporary. I'll just end by saying our purpose, our mission is faithfulness. Are you striving for faithfulness because you're being consumed by the thing that is eternal? Your union, marriage with Christ. If you don't have a union with Christ yet, you want to become a Christian? Uh, Paul says, if you're baptized into Christ, you're united with his death, burial, and his resurrection. That's why Jesus says in Mark 16, 15 to 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved because we are coming to God through Christ in union with his sacrifice and with his resurrection. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that. Study about that with us. But it may be that you need some encouragement or some direction. You may need the empathy of those around you to be able to refix yourselves, not on the temporary things of life, but on that which is eternal, your union with Christ. I encourage you in that way. Randy has a song of encouragement. If you have a need at this particular moment, we can lift you up in prayer to God and encourage you. I, I encourage you to do that as we stand and sing.